Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the Business School of the University of Edinburgh, to whom we are once again enormously grateful for allowing the Asia Scotland Institute to hold an event here. Uh, many of you already know what we do, but our core mission is essentially to help tomorrow's leaders in Scotland, people sometimes at the early stage of their career, begin to understand the complexities of Asia and to equip themselves with the skills and the knowledge to engage effectively in a way in which their forebears, I'm speaking of the Scots now, undoubtedly did, if you go back two generations. We do that through running programs in three areas. Business and economics, some of you have been to the Adam Smith series of global economic briefings. The next one is on Friday, in here, when Lord Desai from the London School of Economics will be speaking about India's economy in free fall or a pause. That will be very interesting. The, the second area that we look at is that of policy and politics, and we've launched uh, an ambassador series where ambassadors of different countries and high commissioners come to talk about what's going on in their countries. Two weeks ago, we had the high commissioner of Singapore. And in the field of business leaders, uh, later in the coming months, you will hear from Xavier Rollet, who is the chief executive of the London Stock Exchange, about capital movements and other stock exchanges, and Dominic Barton, the head of McKinsey and Company worldwide, talking about the challenges that countries and companies face. But however rich a program, it is not complete without understanding the culture, the diverse cultures of the different countries of Asia and the way in which they are interconnected. Uh, and we are incredibly lucky to have with us this evening Sunita Kohli uh, to talk to us about her work and to introduce her now I'm going to ask April Gow, who is a member of the International Advisory Council, to speak to you. Thank you. Good evening. I am delighted to be asked to introduce my good friend Sunita Kohli on her talk on Lutchens and the planning of New Delhi. Sunita arrived on Monday from Delhi where she lives and presides over an international architectural and interior design firm called K2 India, one of the top firms in the country. She is a research-based interior designer, a leader in historical re architectural restoration, and a manufacturer of fine contemporary and classical furniture. She has worked in several countries Notably, Egypt, where she has designed several resorts and luxury hotel boats on the Nile for the Oberoi Group, and most recently has worked in Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. She specializes in the design of public buildings, hotels and resorts, luxury hotel boats, heritage properties such as forts and palaces, aircrafts, corporate offices, and private residences. In New Delhi, Sunita has restored and decorated many period buildings from the time of the British Raj, designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, Sir Herbert Baker, and Sir Robert Tor Russell, notably the monumental Rashtrapati Bhawan, which is the former Viceroy's Palace, the Prime Minister's Office and the Secretariat, and the beautiful Hyderabad House. She has also restored the, <clears throat> the official residence of the Prime Minister, the bungalows of Indira Gandhi Memorial Museum, among several others in the Luchens bungalow zone. She is presently working again on the restoration, decoration, and modernization of Rashtrapati Bhawan. She has also collaborated with the renowned Indian architect, Charles Correa, on the interior design of the British Council, which is the biggest of, of all the 80 council buildings. Sunita has received the, the Padman Shri Award from the Government of India, which is the equivalent of a damehood in, in the UK. That same year, she was presented with the Mahila Shiromani Award, which recognizes women of achievement by Mother Teresa. We are delighted that she has traveled to Scotland to speak about her work this evening at the Edinburgh Business School and last night at the Glasgow School of Art. And tonight I know you're going to enjoy very much to hear about Lutyens and the creation of New Delhi. 
Thank you. Thank you, April, for those very, very kind words. It is a great pleasure and an honor for me to be uh, present for this talk of the Asia Scotland Institute at the University of Edinburgh's Business School. I particularly thank Mr. Roddy Gao, uh, Chairman of ASI, for inviting me, and I was delighted to accept when I received the invitation. But I think if Latians had been present here today, he would have disapproved of me, a professional designer. <laughs> Nothing personal, of course. Lutchins was once asked in 1932 at an informal meeting of the Architectural Association. Uh, he was asked, so what do you think of women in the field of professional architecture? And his reply was, it depends upon which architect they marry. I am not <laughs> married to an architect. <laughs> For this talk titled Sir Edwin Lutyens and the Creation of New Delhi, I think it may be appropriate to begin with a brief outline of British Indian history. The British had arrived in India at the beginning of the 17th century. It was essentially to trade. It was only in 1877 that the British Empire in India was established and Queen Victoria was proclaimed Queen Empress of India by Lord Lytton, who was the then Viceroy of India. And is in, it is interesting that later his daughter, Emily, became the wife of Lutyens. The British Empire lasted till India's independence in 1947. The architectural history of British India is a story of constant experimentation with different styles of buildings. And in that map, whatever you see in pink is the extent of the British Empire in 1900. There had never been a definitive imperial style, but the search for one had occupied the British for their entire stay in India. In the early years, buildings were fundamentally commercial and were usually erected by amateur architects or military engineers using available pattern books for prototypes. However, in the late 18th century, it was acknowledged by the British that historically in India, power was judged by its outward expression and that the greatness of a civilization was expressed in its architecture. There were three main cities where much building activity took place. The first was Madras, which is in South India, where the style of architecture was basically Indo-Saracenic and um, uh, this is an old slide of uh, the old Madras Club and the Madras Railway Company. And I'm sure many of, I think much of the railways was dealt with in Glasgow as I learned yesterday. Um, the other city in the east was considered, was Calcutta, which was considered calm, respectable, orthodox, and its leading materials were brick and plaster. And here we see Belvedere, and the second building that we see is, is Government House, which was the first really important British building that was built in 1798, and the architect was Charles Wyatt. And this Government House was based on Kedliston Hall, uh, which was the seat of the Curzons, and this was designed by Robert Adam. Bombay in the West, remained dominated by its Ruskinian Gothic buildings, which were still being constructed well into the 1990s. And uh, here you see um, Elphinstone a Circle, and this is Victoria Terminus. But it was to be at New Delhi that the architectural experiments of the previous generations were to find their resolution in a wholly original style of architecture. This was to be neither Indian nor European, but a complete fusion of the two traditions. Today's talk is an account, not only of the planning of New Delhi by Sir Edwin Lutyens, but also of the styling of this new city. The story begins in December 1911, when the coronation Darbar was held at Delhi. Here, King George V announced by imperial proclamation the creation of a new capital at Delhi. 
Until now, Calcutta was the seat of government for the four winter months. Simla, a hill station in the north of India, was the seat for the eight summer months. Delhi was chosen by the government because it was said to be central, to have a healthy climate and ease of access. It was almost equidistant from Karachi in the east, uh, in the west, sorry, Bombay and Calcutta. So Karachi is here. Here is Delhi. And this is Bombay and this is Calcutta. Here. Uh, Lord Curzon had been Viceroy of India from 1897 to 1905. Curzon still possessed considerable influence in London on Indian affairs. He campaigned vociferously in, Eng in England against the project on the grounds of expense. In Calcutta, the European as well as the Indian population were also vociferous in protesting against their capital city being relegated to the status of a provincial one. Indians as a whole were very much against the choice of Delhi. Moreover, it had been for generations uh, the Mughal capital before the British came to India and uh, gained power, and this did not please the Hindus. The only thing about the choice that satisfied all sections of Indian opinion was that according to tradition, every new city built at Delhi presaged the collapse of a dynasty. The ruins of at least six other cities lay scattered over the great plain of Delhi and still do. Only the seventh city of Shah Jahanabad was relatively still intact. This was built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, who, as you know, was also the builder of the Taj Mahal. And this is Shah Jahanabad. This momentous plan of shifting the capital was so controversial that fewer than 20 people had known about it. On December 15, uh, 1911, King George V laid the foundation stone with the words, and I quote, it is my desire that the planning and designing of the public buildings to be erected will be considered with great deliberation and care so that the new creation will in every way be worthy of this ancient and beautiful city." Close quote. Now for the laying out of the new capital city, Sir Reginald uh, Blomfield, who was the then president of uh, the Royal Institute of British Architects, recommended Lachians. And this was on the strength of his reputation. Uh, he had done many uh, country houses in England, he had done the public buildings in Pretoria and Johannesburg, and he had also done uh, the pavilion uh, in the Rome exhibition of 1910. So this is Lachians. This is Castle Drogo, which many of you may be familiar with. And this is Heathcote. Uh, this is Britannic House. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the Pretoria. And this is Rome, 1910, which is now actually the British school in Rome. But who was Edwin Lutyens? Lutyens was born in 1869, and though indifferently educated, he became the best known architect of the, uh, uh, of the 20th century. Lutyens' career lasted about 50 years. Though his career spanned the birth and flowering of the modern movement, he remained distant from it. He was dubbed the last traditionalist. In later years, Lachin several times expressed regrets that he had not been better educated. Yet he told his children that he owed his success to never having been to school or university. I mean, that last remark is really not meant for the consumption of any student who might be here from the business school. <laughs> He said, and I quote, any talent I may have was due to a long illness as a boy, which afforded me time to think and to subsequent ill health, because I was never allowed to play games. And so had to teach myself for my enjoyment to use my eyes instead of my feet. His gift for drawing was as natural to him as perfect pitch is to some people. 
It is said of him that he was a natural mathematician. At the age of 18, Lutyens was apprenticed to Ernest George, one of the most popular uh, architects of the day. And there Lutyens met Herbert Baker, who much later was to be his collaborator in, in Delhi. And Baker records in his memoirs that Lutyens did little work there. He just seemed to joke around and criticize the work of others and for the six months that he was there. Uh, to quote Baker, he puzzled us at first, but we soon found that he seemed to know by intuition some great truths of our art which were not to be learned there." Close quote. Latin set up office in 1889 when he was barely 20. His first commission was to build a nine-bedroomed house at Crooksbury, which is near London. And for the rest of his life, he made a habit of designing something every day, whether it was ever to be used or not. It is said of Lachians that his wonderful fund of ideas uh, were really at, not expressed in speech, were, but at, were at the end of a pencil. Lachians' popula popularity became immense. In the early 1900s, it was a desire of every Edwardian gentleman of means to have a house designed by Lutyens and the gardens designed by Gertrude Jekyll, who was then the best known garden designer of her time. And we're very fortunate that this afternoon we had lunch in a wonderful Lutyens house, Grey Walls, courtesy Roddy. Back to Delhi. In 1913, a town planning commission uh, was set up, of, uh, and this was set up for the new uh, for the new uh, capital to be formed, and they had to go and look, uh, find a place where this new capital city could be built. In the center, you see Lutyens. Of course, they had to go around in an elephant, and eventually, after much back and forth, they decided on the old Acropolis of Ricina Hill, which is where the principal building of Lutyens started, and that was a Viceroy's house. And as, and uh, Lutyens proposed that Viceroy's house was to be the focal point of this new city. This was to be flanked by two secretariat buildings, that is, this is Viceroy's house with its gardens. This was to be flanked by two buildings, and in the center was to be the main path, and uh, this later became uh, India Gate. Uh, the Viceregal site would serve as a crucial anchor for the central axis of the plan. The palace's spacious forecourt would lead into the principal pathway, which would continue as a processional route called Kingsway, and today it is called Rajpath. A north-south avenue, Queensway, which now has the Indian name of Janpath, meaning the People's Way, was to cut Kingsway at right angles and terminate in the new railway station. At the juncture of the two avenues, four big buildings were to form a cultural as well as an intellectual plaza. The Oriental Institute, the National Museum, the National Library, and an Imperial Records Office. Of this, only uh, the Records Office was built, which is today called the National Archives, and it is a gem of a building. And uh, the National Museum was built shortly after partition after partition and independence. Later, it was decided that the All India War Memorial Arch, renamed India Gate, together with a memorial for King George V, would complete the ceremonial route of Kingsway. This ceremonial route was to be two miles long and twice as wide as the Champs-Élysées in Paris. All around was planned a garden city. Lachins found major historical monuments useful to provide strong visual focal points. He was clearly influenced by vistas in Rome, boulevards in Paris and Versailles, and of course, La Enfant's uh, plan of the new capital in Washington, D.C. And here you see Versailles, and this is uh, La Enfant's plan of uh, Washington, D.C. Lord Harding was the Viceroy of India from 1910 to 1915. He was the one vi Viceroy who was the most deeply involved in all the initial 
and crucial decisions in the planning of this new capital city. 25 years later, Lachian spoke of his founding role and declared, Harding's command that one avenue should lead to Purana Kila, the old 13th century fort, and another to the Jama Masjid, the old 16th century fort. This is the Purana Kila. The next one is the Jama Masjid. Uh, was the father of the equilateral and hexagonal plan, close quote. Um, and this, these are diagrams which actually show the development of this hexagonal and equilateral plan. And this is so based on Islamic geometry that if you see the Jalis in Humayun's tomb in New Delhi, which is the most important Islamic monument uh, in India, you will see this very clearly from where this geometry came. Now, apart from the plan of this new capital, there was also the question of style. As I mentioned earlier, a definitive imperial style had yet not been conceived or achieved. In April 1912, at the Viceroy's written request, the Delhi committee had gone to Jaipur and then on to Agra to study both Hindu and Mughal architecture. Lachians was not impressed by either. This is Chandar Mahal, which is in Jaipur. And this is Rang Mahal, also this, uh, in Jaipur. And this is the Taj Mahal. And this is Fatehpur Sikri. After this visit, he wrote to his wife, Personally, I do not believe there is any real Indian architecture or any great tradition. They are just spurts by various mushroom dynasties. Color they have, or God gave them, when the earthquakes or convulsions made the stone." Close quote. During this visit, he also sent Herbert Baker, the architect with whom by this time he had already worked in Pretoria, two recipes for Indian architecture. I quote, Hindu, set square stones and build childwise. But before you erect, carve every stone differently and independently with lace patterns and terrifying shapes on top. This is Hindu architecture. This is the great temple in Khajura. Mughal build a vasty mass of rough concrete, elephant-wise, on a very simple rectangular come octagon plan, done in anyhow, cutting off square. Inlay jewels and cornelians if you can afford it, and rob someone if you can't. Then on top of the mass, put three turnips in concrete and overlay with stone or marble as before. Close quote. This is Humayun's tomb. However, what did delight him in Mughal buildings were the gardens with their pools, fountains, and running water. The question of style resulted in a fierce debate. On one side were those who favored Mughal architecture, and on the other side were those who insisted that European classicism, classicism alone could represent empire in stone. In the end, both these extreme and purest views were largely rejected. The king himself had been strongly in favor of a Mughal style of architecture. Lachins' private comment on this was, and I quote, fancy Shakespeare being asked by Elizabeth to write an ode in Chaucerian meter, close quote. The Viceroy had highly favored the pointed arch. To Lachian's, the round arch was an integral part of his design. He cared passionately about it. He wrote to ba Baker, and I quote, I should like to ask him, meaning Harding, to what country the rainbow belongs. One cannot tinker with a round arch. God did not make the eastern rainbow pointed to show his wide sympathies." Close quote. Lachins eventually came to the conclusion and convinced the king and Lord Harding accordingly that what was needed was a synthesis of Eastern and Western styles. This was something very different from grafting Eastern excrescences onto a Western building, which he felt had been strongly advocated. Lachins was confirmed as the architect for New Delhi in 1913. It was expected that all the main buildings would be finished by 1918, 
a target date, of course, that could not be met because the First World War came into play. It is fortunate for architectural historians that many of Lachins's impressions, comments, and observations made during, he made 19 voyages. Uh, and these are 2,500 letters that he wrote to his wife. They, are, they have been loaned to the Royal Institute of British Architects. And so one can see them there. In one of his letters, he wrote, and I quote, to express modern India in stone, to represent her amazing sense of the supernatural with its complement of profound fatalism and enduring patience is no easy task. This cannot be done by the almost sterile stability of the English classical style, nor can it be done by capturing Indian details and inserting their features like hanging pictures on a wall. I continue the quote, in giving India some new sense of architectural construction adapted to her crafts lies a great chance of creating what may become a new and inspirational period in the history of her, of her art, close quote. With the resolution of style, the principal buildings of the new capital started to be built. Foremost amongst these was Viceroy House called Rashpati Bhavan after independence. And around this, the whole city was envisaged. Larger than Versailles, it was conceived as a three-dimensional classical Renaissance composition with many finely and intrinsically integrated vernacular idioms of Indian architecture. Viceroy's house was the largest palace that was to be built in the past 100 years. In this building, the principal fronts the principal fronts are 640 feet wide, and the north and south fronts are 540 feet. The circumference at the base is over half a mile long. It has four floors with some 340 rooms and lodges of varying sizes. The covered floor area is 200,000 square feet. Some 700 million bricks and 3 million cubic feet of stone went into the structure with comparatively little use of cement and steel. At the peak of its construction, 29,000 laborers worked there. Also in this house, Lachins worked with many quintessential elements of indigenous architecture, realizing the crucial importance of light and shade, he introduced the loggias, which you see here. These run right around the external faces of the presidential palace and mask the actual window and door openings. They also provide a superb common repetitive theme. From Rajput and Mughal architecture, Lach Lachins adopted, which actually you can still see in this slide, adopted chajjas, chhatris, and jalis. Jalis is lattice work in stone. Lachins acknowledged the vital role of color and texture. Uh, this is, now this is a jali that you see, uh, which is in the doorways that lead into the Mughal garden. Now this jali is taken completely from uh, the jali that is in the red fort, which we can even see today. Um, and because Lachins recognized what the Mughals had done with color and texture, he therefore used the same red sandstone that the Mughals had used at Fatehpur Sikri, which you know is Akbar's impressive 17th century fort just outside Agra. He interspersed the red sandstone with local cream stone in brilliant horizontal bands of color. This accentuated the vast horizontal emphasis of the whole building. The dominant feature of the house is the central dome. Here is a copper hemisphere rising from a white stone drum incised with railings, directly influenced by the great stupa at Sanchi, which is earlier than the 6th century BC. Now below this, this is Sanchi, and below this massive dome is the equally impressive 80-foot domed Darbar Hall used mainly for investiture ceremonies. Here is a section of it. This is 13 feet high uh, palladian doors, 
and entrance doors and the Palladian influence is clearly seen because it has four abscesses inset into the walls and their vaulted roofs are enriched with coffered squares. In this design, Lachians was clearly influenced by the second century pantheon in Rome, which he deeply admired. Lachians incorporated into his design three intrinsic Indian motifs. He used the cobra in the fountains of the South Court. He had elephants engraved on the gates, the pillars, and the entrances to the basement. And these are directly copied from the elephants, again, in the Red Fort. Uh, the lotus motif was also, this is, uh, he used the lotus motif. This is the Jaipur column, and this is the lotus fountain in the Mughal gardens. And, uh, but I think his greatest achievement was that to the five classical orders of Western architecture, he added the sixth order, which is the Delhi order. And these are very handsome columns. Uh, these are very handsome columns, and the capitals have have four bells. And as you all know, that the bell is very Im is a very important symbol uh, that is used in Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain architecture. But India was integrated into uh, more than merely the structure. For the interior detailing, the furnishings of this house. Lachins found skilled Indian craftsmen who had worked for generations in their villages. And uh, one gathered from the memoirs of Mary Lachins, who was Lachins' youngest daughter, and who I was fairly well acquainted with in the last seven years of her life, that Lachins had wanted to use khadi, um, which, as you know, is hand spun, um, made out of hand spun yarn, and it is woven in all the villages in India. And, uh, and Gandhi advocated the spinning of, uh, of Khadi also in towns and cities. And this became a very powerful symbol of protest against British rule in India. When Lachins found that Khadi was inappropriate to be used for as upholstering material, uh, he then had to perforce had to buy materials from England and from France. And in my involvement and engagement as an an honorary designer for Rashtrapati Bhavan from 1986 to 1989, and I'd done a small bit in, nine, in 1982 when the Queen had come and stayed at Rashtrapati Bhavan. Um, and this was for restoration, maintenance, and refurbishing. I used Khadi silk because of having read about it in the memoirs of Mary Lachians. And uh, on one of my trips, uh, shortly after 1986, when I went to England, I showed the photographs of the rooms that I had restored and done. And uh, Mary Lutchins was quite delighted to know that I had uh, used Khadi, which had been advocated by her father. And I think the biggest compliment she ever s said to me about all my work in Lutchins, she said, you should have been in my father's original team, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Uh, now, this is, these are quick photographs I'm going to show you of the interiors of Rashtrapati Bhavan. These are very old photographs from 1940, which are in the possession of his, uh, were in the possession of his son, and now they're at the Royal Institute of British Architects. This is the South Drawing Room, and this is what I did in 1986. Uh, this is, again, another 1986. This is another detail. Uh, this is the North Drawing Room, and this again is 1986. I, I saw to it that I used only the furniture that had been designed by Lutchens. This is the Morning Room, and this is the Long Drawing Room, and it is now a conference room for governors. So that is what, and this is the Banquet Hall, and this is the Banquet Hall today. Uh, this is the library, and this is one room where Lutchins took great care to lay out the flooring. And he based the flooring on the Hindu mandala. Mandala is a sacred sim symbol. And um, you can see portions in this old photograph. So it's a, it's a room which has been exquisitely detailed, particularly the flooring. And of course, Lutchins also designed a lot of furniture. And these were for, for uh, for formal robes of the Viceroy. And he designed clocks, he designed handles, 
he designed the furniture, uh, he designed everything uh, that really went into the house. And uh, this photograph was taken in Britannic house, but this was of sofas that were designed for Rashpati Bhavan. And uh, now I'm working on this again. And um, uh, this is a 1931 uh, uh, um, uh, drawing, uh, which I've been given. And, and this is a drawing that I have done today. And what used to be Viceroy's house uh, a viceroy's suite has now become is now becoming the state guest suites. So, and this is a project that is going to be got ready by the December of this year. Now, the government uh, to go back to uh, to when Lachins was designing, the government of India had also commanded a Mughal garden, which means terraces, waterways, and sunken courts. He had written. Inside the vast establishment of the palace, the Mughal gardens, which are 250 acres, were the only component which Lachins clearly acknowledged as the direct heritage of the Mughals. Lachins actually never really acknowledged all his Indian sources or his Indian inspiration. In all respects, the viceregal establishment was appropriately imperial in scale. Apart from the palace buildings, the estate has a swimming pool, a squash court, a cricket ground, a nine-hole golf course, and eight tennis courts. The palace was completed in 17 years instead of four, mainly because of the First World War. It was conceived in Lachins' word, uh, words as one complete organism, perfect and inseparable. And actually, therein lies the genius of Edmund Lachins. In this palace, because in this palace there are no afterthoughts, there are no appendages, which you find in many palaces and, uh, you know, large mansions around the world. And of course, you know, this house saw many, many famous visitors and probably uh, the most famous of them all was, this is Gandhi with the Mount Battens. And now, as part of the collaborative agreement between Lutchins and Baker, uh, Baker was, uh, was to design the secretariat buildings called North and South Block. To quote the architectural historian Philip Davies, they are wonderful pieces of civic design which have the same architectonic discipline as Lutchins' Viceroy's house. These two enormous buildings, each about the size of the Houses of Parliament in London, are built on three levels and have about a thousand rooms connected by 12 miles of corridors. So this is, um, this is also North and South Block, and there you can see the dome of Rashtrapati Bhavan in the background. But in the positioning of Viceroy's house in relation to the two secretariat buildings, arose the famous battle of the gradient debate between Lutchins and Baker, a battle which Lutchins eventually lost. Thereafter, Lutchins always referred to it as his Baker law, and he never spoke to Baker after having lost this debate. But that's a very long story of what happened, so uh, we'll carry on. Baker was also responsible for Parliament House, although the Colosseum design was suggested by, uh, by Lutyens. Parliament House is a huge circular building in red and buff sandstone with open colonnaded verandas encircling the entire cir circumference. You see the verandas here. Now when the staff bungalows were to be commissioned, Lutyens' plans were considered too expensive by the, uh, by the Delhi committee whereas Baker's bungalows, as Lachins called them, spelt B-U-N-G-L-E-O-H-S, bungalows, were approved. Lachins asked to be relieved from the anguish of designing these jerry villas, as he called them, in exchange for building all the houses of the princes along Kingsway. This was granted. Hyderabad House was one of them, and I've also had the privilege in 1989 of completely restoring Hyderabad House. 
This palace was built for the Nawab of Hyderabad, at that time reputed to be the richest man in the world. Bill Gates hadn't arrived on the scene by then. Luchins also helped in the construction of various other houses. Most of these, I'll show you Hyderabad house, this is it. Uh, various other sort of uh, other architects also arrived because they were attracted that this new capital city was being built and of course they were hugely in influenced by the style of Lachins in his principal buildings. And um, a number of these civic buildings were designed by Robert Tor Russell and he designed Eastern Court, Western Court and he designed Connaught Place which is an early photograph of you which you see here, which is based on the circus in Bath. And which was at that time, Connaught Place was considered the finest design shopping area in the world. And it was meant to be the central commercial hub of this new city. But Lutchins is supposedly, uh, not Lutchins, I beg your pardon, Russell's supposedly best work was Flagstaff House, which was the house for the commander in chief. And it best approximates the style that Lachins had developed for New Delhi. And after independence, it became the official residence of the Prime Minister of India. Lachins was also, this is uh, Teen Murti House as we call it now. Lachins was also given the prize commission of designing the All India War Memorial Arch, now known as India Gate, and King George V Memorial. India Gate is a colossal structure, almost 140 feet high, inscribed with a single word, India. And this, of course, he based on Arc de Triomphe in, in Paris and uh, several other triumphal arches which you find around <laughs> Europe. Now, as an integral part of the new capital, numerous churches were also planned. Uh, this is a detail of uh, from India Gate, which actually Lachins took from the Vatican. And uh, this, uh, this uh, source and inspiration, he uh, acknowledged, whereas he's, as I mentioned earlier, he never acknowledged his, his Indian sources of inspiration, which is a pity because the man was a genius. He was brilliant. He didn't uh, need to have not have acknowledged what he took from India. Um, and various churches were also, be, this is uh, from where he took it in the Vatican. And this is uh, King George V Memorial. Now this church, churches were also built and this is the Church of the Re Re Redemption. And this is a church which breaks away. This was designed by Shoesmith. It's called St. Martin's Church, which is in Delhi Contournement. And this kind of bro started to break away from what Lachins had, uh, the style that Lachins had was promulgating for this new capital. Now, New Delhi was conceived as an entirely government town. The Indian populace at large was excluded. Housing within the enclave was strictly hierarchical. There were palaces for the viceroy and the commander in chief. Lesser palaces were planned for the chiefs of the native states. All these were surrounded by parks and in a decreasing order of domestic grandeur came a whole set of bungalows. I quote, caste was as carefully honored in the disposition of these houses as ever it was among the Hindus, close quote. And as you know, unfortunately, Hindu society is not only class-based, but is, it is also caste-ridden. So this is what he was acknowledging. Lachins had always maintained that there will never be great architects or great architecture without great patrons. In this case, it was the British government of India who commissioned him to plan New Delhi and to design its central buildings. New Delhi was officially named in 1926 and was officially inaugurated in 1931. Now, regarding a name for the new city, an assistant of Lachins uh, recollects that Lachins was never really a particularly good uh, committee man. Um, and there was, a, it was a sweltering summer afternoon and they were being uh, called to decide on a name and various names like George Bad and Mary Paw were being kind of, uh, you know, thrown about. 
and it's because that in in the naming of Indian cities you use poor uh, like Jaipur and you use bad which like Aurangabad uh, which means place and Lachins of course at one point he reached a point of extreme boredom and he suddenly said let's call it Uzipo everybody was so shocked that you know they just called it New Delhi and New Delhi it has remained uh, for the official opening of New Delhi in January 1931, Lachins and his wife went together to India together with Edward Hudson, who was then the influ in very influential owner of Country Life and a great friend and patron of Lachins. They all stayed at Viceroy's house with L Lord and Lady Irvin, and Hudson was reportedly so moved that he could hardly keep from tears. He said, Poor old Christopher Wren could never have done this. Lachians only kissed the wall of the house as he left. And this is, um, in, a, in the miniature style, this is done by Shoesmith. And you have Lord Irvin here. This is, uh, this is Lachians presenting the keys of the house. And this is Baker behind him and, and uh, Rouse, who was the chief engineer. And there you see Lady Irvin in Parda at the back. Uh, architecture is building with wit is perhaps the key to both Lachian's the man and his buildings. And this is a caricature, a bust of Lachian's, which is today in the Royal Institute of British Architects. And instead of a solar topi, he's wearing a hat, which has the, a copula of a Rashpati Bhavan. And uh, then those are his glasses. And of course, you know, these are, oh, these are ventilators that he created. And these lead into the garden. And they all approximate his own spectacles. Uh, New Delhi, the greatest was the greatest achievement of Lachins's long architectural career. And it is an expression of Lachins's rare originality of mind and creative genius. Lachins's gift to India is the sense of space and order with which he laid out this new planned capital city. To quote Philip Davies again, the monumental conception and scale of New Delhi is the crowning British achievement in India. But it is a supreme irony that it found its greatest eloquence at the very moment that the imperial impulse was faltering. Lachians took the best of both traditions and made of them a double magnificence." Close quote. Today, this heritage needs to be preserved and conserved for future generations. It is somewhat under threat, although serious attempts are being made to enforce legislation to conserve the Lachins bungalow zone as these 33 square miles that Lachins uh, planned are called. And today we are trying to have it declared a World Heritage Site. And two years ago we managed to have Rashtrapati Bhavan listed as a National Heritage Building. It took 20 years to do so, to end and that Although the imperial idea did not last, New Delhi has. It is the artistic strength of Lachins's conception and plan that dominates New Delhi even today. Lachins created a truly great capital city. Thank you. Sunita, thank you so much. I, I, perhaps I could start by asking you uh, this question, then we'll open to the floor. These great architectural um, achievements uh, designed by an Englishman, built in India, how are they viewed now by people in India? You know, there was a time when they were viewed as something anachronistic, but as we have also matured as a nation, because you know, we might be, uh, we might be a very old country, but we are a young nation, we are 67 years old. Now, uh, Lachins has suddenly gained huge popularity. There was also a time, uh, Roddy, don't forget, that Lachins' reputation, even in England, had gone down. Because when the modern movement started and everything else happened. 
So today, Lachins is hugely admired in India. Thank you very much. Um, it was a, a fascinating talk. Uh, sorry, is it on yes, right? yes. It's a fascinating talk and to hear the, the, the story unfold. And uh, generally speaking, as a, as a town planner, where, where we were accustomed to things going from the, the bottom up, from the grassroots opinion and uh, shaping whatever uh, people live in, clearly Lutchens fell in very well to the idea of a, of a top-down type of uh, of of, uh, of structure or uh, or or, um, or a, a brief which came from uh, from on high, as it were. Uh, I think that notably Patrick Geddes um, uh, met Lutchens, and uh, I think it was said that there was not a a meeting of minds as to the the, the approach which we were both taking. But when we look at these these um, works today and, and see them well regarded, well, I think the justification was there. But I wonder if you had any comments on uh, on, 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 on Geddes uh, and, and his particular approach to, to work in India and as, as opposed to what we, what we see and enjoy from, from Lutchens. Thank you. Thank you. The difference is really, uh, the huge difference is, Lachins was creating an imperial capital. So the whole approach is entirely different. Because if you even notice in, in, in Great Britain, what Lachins has created in the three dozen country houses that he has done, or even in Castle Drogo, cannot even begin to match in scale what Lachins was designing in New Delhi. So I think it's unfair to compare any other architect with what Lutchens had been commissioned to do. Um, the thing that's uh, one of your, the little asides that I find extraordinarily impressive is that here was an architect who had, um, after all, to uh, uh, do the designs, but also somebody was orchestrating 29,000 craftsmen. Yes. Was that Lutchens as well, or did he have, uh, what sort of structure did he have, what sort of team did he have um, that was uh, making sure that uh, everybody did the right thing? That's a very good question, because the scale was so large. I mean, there was a whole railway built, uh, if you've been to New Delhi, uh, there was a whole railway built which was carrying these massive blocks of stone. Uh, Lachins had four principal architects. They were all Sardars. Uh, they were all Sikh gentlemen. Uh, Lachins himself had, had decided that he wanted to use Indian craftsmen and the skill sets that these craftsmen brought. So for instance, if you see, if I can just have a minute. For instance, if you see all the magnificent carpets that are in uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan were woven in Indian jails, principally in Agra and Jaipur jail. And they're extremely valuable today. When they come up for auction, either in uh, Christie's or Sotheby's, they go much above any other type of carpet. Uh, Lachins used uh, carpenters uh, from the north, from Lahore, from the Punjab. So he, he decided what he was going to use which were the master craftsmen that he was going to use. And of course, there was this entire office, Shoesmith, uh, who painted, a miss, actually Mrs. Shoesmith painted that miniature, which I showed. But Shoesmith himself was a great perspectivist, uh, although, of course, he was totally responsible for the Battle of the Gradient because of where he, what he showed. So Lachin's, uh, set up, he had decided to use, he spent many, many months in India because each voyage, and he had 19 voyages, was spread over several months. Uh, so he had a whole office that was here that was working to answer your question, and he had these four principal contractors. I'm Adash, I'm a novelist of a university. Uh, I'm from Sweden. so. My question is a uh, very interesting talk, and I didn't know anything about New Delhi. Um, but from an architectural point of view, do you think the British could learn from the way that Indian, uh, in the building at the back, you see the archway, the red stone, 
Do you think that the British can learn from Indian architects today coming over here or vice versa? If that makes any sense. Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you. Uh, yes. I think the Indians learned from Britain and British architects and uh, and uh, and uh, you know British architects could possibly learn from our great architecture of the past being principally Mughal. I mean look how much of Mughal architecture <coughs> Lachins incorporated into his buildings. So uh, and certainly but what he created was totally original. And I think we have more actually to learn from him than uh, the other way around. You ended there with a really um, interesting point about uh, the architect building in some of his own personality or branding. Um, are you tempted at all when you're working on these restorations, not just to draw on the history, but to leave a little of yourself behind in the design? Ah. Uh. That's a personal question, and I'm glad you asked it, because uh, I'm an architectural, interior architectural <coughs> restorer and an architectural restorer, and I'm also a designer of hotels. And my two approaches in my professional career have been totally different. When I design a hotel, say for the Oberoi's, I've done a lot of work in Egypt for them and hotel boats, I am conceptualizing and conceiving. And it is, uh, it is my vision of what needs to be done or designed. But when I'm restoring, I'm very sensitive and conscious of the fact that I'm restoring uh, the work of, particularly uh, Lachins, the work of a great architect. And so what I do is, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a research-based designer and a restorer. So what I do do is, through research, what was there originally? But I don't, so this is what I do, I respect that. And I hope that in two years' time, nobody will even know that there was the intervention of an uh, interior restorer. But just to say something. It doesn't mean that if the British viceroys left chins, that I'm going to use chins. I will use Indian fabrics, because at the end of the day, Rashtrapati Bhavan is now the, the palace of the president, who is the president of a very proud republic. So that also I'm conscious of. Uh, you're an Eastern, I'm a lawyer, but I seek to redeem myself by being a member of the Luchins Trust. Yeah. And there may be a slight hint of this in the question. You mentioned that uh, Luchins nowadays is hugely admired in India. I was wondering whether that bounder baker is held in similar regard. Ah, so am I a member of the Luchins Trust, and I have been for many, many years. Um, you know, baker, uh, I, please forgive me for saying so, um, but baker, I think, was a lesser architect than Luchins was. Because what Baker did, uh, what Lachins did was he created something totally original. And as Philip Davies said, he created a double magnificence. There is a reason why historical, uh, I mean, architectural historians revere him. It's because of his originality. Now what Baker did, and if particularly, I didn't show that slide in, in, in detail, of the north and south block. Uh, but if you see the domes that are there, uh, the principal domes of Baker's building, they have eight elephants around. So what he's done is that the dome is very Renaissance, and he's just stuck the elephants onto them. So that is, uh, that is an approach which Lachins never took. That's all I'd like to say, because I remember once at a lecture, it became so, f the whole debate between Baker and Lachins became so fierce. I mean, who was a better architect and all the rest of it. So we won't go into that today. Can you tell us a little bit, though, about what this Baker Lou was? Because obviously, you hinted at this great dispute. Yes, oh, it was. What, what was it? In, in briefly, what was it? Then? Well, very briefly, uh, uh, 
Viceroy's house was designed at the top of Raisina Hill. And the two secretariat buildings were going to flank it on either side. And Lachians had imagined that, well, he imagined it, that's the way he planned it. And uh, he approved the, the plan of it. And what he approved was that uh, as you kind of went up this gradient, you could, but you might go up the gradient, but you could fully see the forecourt, you know, with all these uh, Delhi order columns. Now, the reason why he was misled was because from his own office, Shoesmith, who was a perspectivist, he took an imaginary point which was 30 feet high above ground. And then he did a one-point perspective. So, of course, you could see the entire forecourt. And Lachins approved the drawing. And so work started to be, to be done. And the foundations had started being dug of North and South Block, these two big massive secretariat buildings. And when Lachins came, he was absolutely appalled. So he spoke to Baker and he told him, he said, look, we have to reverse this. We have to cut the hail, do all of that. But the British government would have none of it. And Baker did not support him because they were in the middle of the First World War. There was shortage of money. So uh, Baker, in fact, uh, Lachins, in fact, became so distressed that he wrote to his wife, Emily, he said, I want to give it all up and return back and never go back to New Delhi. But she dissuaded him from doing so. But he was so disheartened with Baker that he actually never spoke to him ever again in his life. And therefore, he called it his Baker Lou. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, Tina Avery, I'm an architect, local architect. Um, I'm just intrigued as to the level of... Um, survival of the historic interiors. I know he did a lot of furniture. I know he also did light fittings. I wasn't aware of things like carpets and textiles, to be honest. Um, how much of things like the furniture and light fittings and that type of level of static things um, survives in the house, or has a lot of it been sold? You mentioned that rugs went on sale at Christie's. No, no they didn't go on sale. Whenever they, I mean, jail carpets come in. You I know, see. what right. they call I jail see. carpets, okay. not the ones right. from Russia. So Bhavan. just what level of furnishings actually You know, I have to tell you that I have seen several of the Lachins buildings in uh, over 30 years in England. Rashtrapati Bhavan structurally is actually the best preserved of any of Lachins' buildings. I mean, I've seen a lot of buildings which have been gutted, a lot of it which have had stuff which is done to it and have completely changed. I mean, the facade might be there, but everything else has gone. There's not a structural change in what has happened to Rashtrapati Bhavan or to Hyderabad House. But what has happened and what we are trying to do is, is, is um, now um, uh, be we think that Lachins' furniture is extremely important and we, uh, we are trying to put that into every single room. Because, you know, don't forget that after Lachins finished in 1931, also came Lady Willingdon. And she made such changes that he was brought back in 1938 to restore what, what were called the excesses of Lady Willingdon. And he wrote a letter to her saying, Madam, if you had the Parthenon to design, you know, you would have put bay, uh, what bay windows to it. <laughs> so, and what she did was in the long drawing room, there was a slide that I had shown, in the long drawing room, she had that uh, transverse kind of barrel vaulted ceiling painted. So he had it painted white back again. So a lot of the excesses that happened, I mean, through the viceroys that were there, uh, there were great excesses that they created, uh, you know, uh, of extreme of, as I mentioned, bringing in chintz and all the rest of it, you know. Today what we are doing is we are, tr we are trying to restore the uh, restoration, uh, restore the furniture, keep the lights, but as far as fabrics, etc. are concerned, we are using fabrics that are done by master weavers, all of whom have won the presidential prize. Because I think that's the sort of thing that should go into our house like that today. I have to ask you if Lady Bambat did anything. 
three terrible horrors. No, she didn't. <laughs> Uh, we'll take two more questions, and then we've got uh, the reception outside. The gentleman at the back first, and then here. The British should, should have taught us one thing, is how to record and document, and how to really conserve. You know, there are some things, I mean, we, there's so much that they left in terms of postal systems and railways, and one can go on. And also, they took a lot, so it wasn't a one-way thing. They took so much. Uh, but I wish they had left a system of documentation, which they didn't. And that is the foundation for any sort of restoration work. So uh, re restoration is poor, but it's picking up speed. And in India, we suffer from an excess of riches. We have too many monuments. And I don't think that we give it, frankly, the sort of respect that every monument deserves. One last question from the gentleman up there. Malcolm Oliver, I'm neither an architect or a town planner, so as far as this is concerned, I'm just an interested man in the street. Just going back to your last answer, you, you're talking about conserving and preserving these buildings. Um, if you're doing something like Hampton Court, it's sort of very easy to preserve it as it was because it's just a, a museum. But a lot of these seem to be living buildings. I'm just wondering how you cope with the challenges of that. I mean, I presume, just at a very trivial level, the President of India likes to use email and things like that. How do you build that sort of modern facility into a building which you still conserve and Can you, since the word facility has been used, I would like you to tell us a little about the lack of facilities which you have to wrestle with, right? Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good place to fall short. Yes. Right? yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are trying to put in a few facilities, <laughs> particularly where the state rooms are, because you know if somebody is desperate, by the time they run down the grand staircase, we don't know what will happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we are trying. And but you know, any intervention like that, it has to be so sensitively dealt with because. Uh, because you know he just didn't didn't create enough facilities like that, and which I believe is also true of his country houses here. So you know, which we were just being told this afternoon. So he built this wonderful house, grey walls, and with one bathroom. <laughs> so. Sanita, so, thank you. Well, I think everybody here would would agree with me that we've heard aspects of India which perhaps was notable exceptions that most people didn't know. Um, I'm particularly interested that, that India, Indian citizens today um, honor, respect, love what they view as part of their own history, perhaps in the way that, that we have come to admire what the Romans left or the Spanish have come to admire Moorish architecture and the like. What really interests me too though is the fact that this is a two-way street and perhaps a gentleman here who's studying architecture will see in India an opportunity to go and practice his skills in conservation. And I think there are very many examples, actually, of modern architecture. We can think of the Middle East and elsewhere, where Asian and other themes are being applied. And, and the most fantastic of buildings created as a result. But, Sunita, you have given us wonderful food for thought. It's, it's great to have one of the world's greatest experts on Latians talk to us. Um, his, uh, his, his baker Lou will always remain with me and this awful lady, what was she called? Lady Not Willingdon. Lady Willingdon, I shall have to Google immediately to find out what she did. So, but as a small gesture of our thanks, here is a, a, a spectacular Scotland book for you to take home. And whilst it may not mirror all of Lutchens' work, at least you did see one today. And to all of you who have come, thank you so much. We hope that uh, you will find a way of supporting what we do. This is a membership organization. We are beginning to get members in now. Very good rates for the man on the top of the Clapham Omnibus and very good rates for those who pretend that they are uh, retired, like me, and extremely good rates for students. That's before we get on to companies and others who we look to. But thank you for coming. Your presence here is a terrific support to us. We've got all sorts of things coming up with which, which with your help, will happen. Thanks again to the Business School, and you will thank the Business School even more if you go and sample some of the wine that they've made available for you outside. Thank you, Sunita, again. Thank you.